I give you Stephen Kotler. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, thank you guys for inviting me. It's good to be back at Google. I think it's been four or five years since I've been here. Um, as Jacques said, I am an author, I am a journalist, and I'm the co-founder and director of research at the Flow Genome Project. And what we study at the Flow Genome Project is ultimate human performance, or what does it take to be your best when it matters most. And what we're really interested in is what does it take for individuals, organizations, sometimes institutions to sort of level up their game like never before. What does it take to achieve paradigm shifting breakthroughs? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. And it kind of in a phrase at the heart of the work that, that I do is really the question of what does it take to do the impossible? And it, at a serious level, if you can sort of get past the hyperbole built into that question. And uh, we are in the middle, oh, it works. We are in the middle of kind of a giant revolution in our ability to do the impossible. And it's a strange revolution. It is extremely counterintuitive. It's overturning a lot of conventional wisdom about high performance. And it's going to be the subject of what I talk about today. And it's sort of this revolution is sitting at the intersection of two smaller revolutions and two overlapping ones. One is a revolution in peak performance that if you've seen my other Google Talks, I talked about then. We're going to cover a little bit of the same ground. And the other is a revolution in what we could call the science of spirituality. And I'm using the term spirituality in the most secular possible definition of the term. And these two things are colliding, and the collision is really, really overturning almost everything we knew about human performance. And um, as a way of introducing this topic, I thought I'd start where I started. I came to the question of how do you accomplish the impossible through a really weird door. I walked in through the door of journalism. I became a journalist in the early 1990s. And back then, action sports, surfing, skiing, rock climbing, and whatever, were getting a lot of attention. And the X Games were starting, the Gravity Games, and there was a lot of work. If you could write and ski and write and rock climb or write and surf, there was a lot of work. And I couldn't do any of those things very well, but I needed the work. So I lied to my editors. And I was lucky enough to spend about 10 years chasing professional athletes around mountains and across oceans. And I will tell you, if you're not a professional athlete and you spend all your time chasing professional athletes around mountains and across oceans, you tend to break things. I broke a lot of things, as you can see. And what this meant is I ended up taking a lot of time off. So I'd be hanging out, I'd snap this or that, and I'd have to take three months, four months, five months off. And when I came back, the progress I saw was really amazing. It was leaps and bounds kind of stuff. It didn't make any sense. Stuff that was absolutely impossible, never been done, never going to be done, just three or four months ago. It wasn't just being done, it was being iterated upon. And this caught my attention for a lot of reasons, but it, not just the obvious. If you go back to the early 1990s, action adventure sport athletes, were a rowdy, punk rock, irreverent bunch of people without a lot of natural advantages. So most of the people I knew in this community they didn't have a lot of education. They had very little money. And most of them had horrific childhood experiences. And yet here they were on a like semi-regular basis reinventing what was possible for our species, right? Expending the limits of physical possibility. And I wanted to know what the hell the hell was this possible? But I'd also broken about 80 bones at that point, and I knew, wait, wait, one example. Sorry, we'll come back to that. One example, I always forget to give this. So I want to give you one example of what I was looking at. If you haven't read Rise of Superman, or aren't familiar with it. And if you saw my earlier talk and I'm repeating myself, I apologize, we're going to burn through this stuff and get to the new stuff. Surfing, thousand year old sport. 480 to 1996, progress is really slow. 25 feet is the biggest wave anybody can surf. Above that, total impossible. There are physics papers written about how you can't paddle into a wave above 25 feet. And as you can see from this slide, today surfers are routinely paddling into waves that are almost 100 feet tall in 20 years. And this was happening all over action sports. So of course, I did want to know what the hell was going on. And I also knew that if I didn't take my question out of action sports and into other domains, I was going to kill myself. And so that's what I did. And I, that's what I did in, in kind of all the next eight of my books. And for example, in Tomorrowland, that was about those maverick innovators who took science fiction ideas and turned them into science fact technology. Right? Bold was wild business entrepreneurs, your own Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, folks like that who had, um, Elon Musk, who had invented incredibly world-changing businesses in near record time against crazy odds. Uh, in abundance, I teamed up with Peter Diamandis, who co-founded the X Prize in Singularity University. And we looked at 
innovators tackling global, impossible global challenges, poverty, water scarcity, energy scarcity, and making dents here, right? And what we discovered, what I discovered after all this, is it doesn't actually matter where you look. It doesn't matter what domain you look in. Wherever you see people performing at their best, whenever you see people tackling the impossible, you see a state of consciousness known to researchers as flow, right? And you may know flow by lots of other names, runner's high, being in the zone, the forever box if you're a stand-up comic, if you play basketball, it's being unconscious. Flow is a technical term and is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel our best and we perform our best. And we're just like so focused on the task at hand, everything else just disappears, right? Action and awareness will merge, sense of self will vanish, time will dilate, fancy way of saying it passes strangely, it'll slow down, you get a freeze frame effect. As soon as it speeds up and five hours go by in like five minutes. And throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. Flow science is really old. Dates back to like the late 1870s, 1880s, very birth of kind of what became psychology, what became cognitive neuroscience. A lot of this work was being done on peak performance way back then. Um, got a huge jump forward in the 1970s and 80s when this guy, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, often called the godfather of flow psychology, uh, he was the chairman of the University of Psycho Chicago Psychology Department and did a giant kind of enormous study on optimal psychology, positive psychology, went around the world, asking people about the times in their lives they felt their best and they performed their best. And he taught us four really kind of fundamental things about flow. It's worth knowing. The first thing is the state is definable. It's got core characteristics. And I named some of these for you a second ago. Absolute concentration in the present moment, the merger of action and awareness, the vanishing of self, time dilation. Because it is definable, it's measurable. We have really well-established psychometric instruments for measuring flow. Um, over and over and over and over they've been examined. They're really solid. So it's definable and it's measurable. It's also universal. Csikszentmihalyi discovered that we are all biologically hardwired for flow. This is how we perform at our best. So the state shows up anywhere in anyone provided certain initial conditions are met. He also named flow. And it's for a very specific reason. So when he was running around the world asking people about the times when they performed their best, people would say the same thing. They'd say, well, when I feel this way, I end up in a state where every action, every decision flows seamlessly, effortlessly, perfectly from the last. So flow is a phenomenological description, right? It describes how the state makes us feel. Interestingly, if you look under that phenomenology, you see something really neat. For flow to feel flowy, for every decision or action to proceed from seamlessly and fluidly and effortlessly from the last, you're looking at high speed, near perfect decision making, right? And near perfect, I need to emphasize. Um, not perfect decision making at all, that's a fallacy. Scott Schmidt, who one of the early extreme skiers, had a great phrase, flow used to make me feel like Superman up until the moment I'm not. And key important safety tip when it comes to this stuff. Um, the last thing he discovered is that flow is fundamental. It is fundamental to well-being, to meaning, to overall life satisfaction. When you do studies of overall life satisfaction and meaning and well-being, people who have the most flow in their lives are the people who score off the charts. Um, and this is another extremely well-established finding. Um, in the next question that people kind of turn their attention to after Csikszentmihalyi's foundational work is, okay, this is optimal performance, how optimal? What the hell are we talking about? The answer is pretty optimal. In sports and athletics, we now know that flow pretty much is at the heart of any gold medal athletic championship that's ever been won. Significant progress in business, or excuse me, in science and technology. I said I, earlier I studied paradigm shifting breakthroughs. Whenever you tend to see paradigm shifting breakthroughs in science and technology, you tend to see flow. Same thing with massive progress in the arts. In business, we have some really compelling data uh, McKinsey took a look at flow and the peak performance, and they found that after a, a long study, the top executives report being five times more productive in flow. That's 500% more productive. Right? That means you go to work on Monday, spend Monday in a flow state, you take Tuesday through Friday off and get the same amount done. Right? Two days a week in flow, and you're 1,000% more productive than the competition. And I will tell you, even though we're not going to talk about business today at all, I will say my organization, a lot of other organizations, we're training up a lot of different organizations, including you guys. And we'll talk about the work we did with you guys at Google a little bit later. But uh, what I wonder is when I, you look at those numbers, and those numbers are, are pretty solid, um, 
how the hell do you keep up if you're not doing this stuff? That's just an open question, and we're not going to linger there. The next thing that happened kind of after we figured out that flow is at the heart of all this optimal performance is there's been a revolution in neuroscience, right? Um, biotechnology right now is moving at five times the speed of Moore's law, right? It is doubling in power roughly every four months, and it is dragging neuroscience along, and it is dragging flow science along. And this is, by the way, one example of, of, of flow research. So this is an experiment designed by Baylor, a uh, Stanford neuroscientist, David Eagleman, back when he was at Baylor. And uh, I've been hoisted 150 feet into a circus net. I'm wearing a perceptual chronometer on my wrist. And we're trying to figure out why time passes so strangely in flow. So I've been dropped. I'm free falling 150 feet and trying to keep track of time. And I will tell you, we did make some progress on that question. I'll talk about that in a second. It also, like six and a half months of chiropractic work till I could walk straight. So, so I want you to know that like I suffered for this information, people. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, so what we've learned in a lot of this new neuroscience is that our old ideas about high performance added things exactly backward. The old idea you guys are familiar with, it's the so-called 10% brain myth. This is the idea that at any one time we'd use a small portion of our brain, say 10%, right? So flow, aka ultimate performance, must be the full brain on overdrive, right? Turns out we had it exactly backwards. In flow, we're not using more of the brain, we're using less. Technical term, transient hypofrontality. Transient meaning temporary, hypo is the opposite of hyper, H-Y-P-O, means to slow down, to shut down, to deactivate. And frontality is this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, right? The portion of your brain that does a lot of your executive functions, higher cognitive functions, complex logical decision making, your sense of morality, your sense of will, long-term planning, this is all prefrontal cortex, turns off in flow. It's an efficiency exchange, um, but as a result, we see some really cool things for performance. For example, what happens when your prefrontal cortex turns off? Well, that's what happens to time. Time is actually a calculation performed by a bunch of different structures all over the prefrontal cortex. And when starts them start to wink out, we can't separate past from present and future. We're plunged into this space people talk about as the eternal present, the elongated now, the deep now. Right? So that's why time passes so strangely in flow. Huge impact on performance. Why? Most of our fears, stuff we're scared about, is either horrible stuff that happened in the past that we'd like to avoid happening in the present, right? or it's scary stuff that might happen in the future and we'd like to avoid from the present. Right? But right here, right now, unless you're facing mortal combat, there's not a whole hell of a lot to be afraid of. Right? So when we drop into flow, when we drop into this deep now, anxiety plummets. Stress hormones literally leave our system. Same thing happens to your sense of self. Self is a network effect. It's produced by a bunch of different structures in the prefrontal cortex, a couple other parts of the brain, talking to each other like any network, right? A bunch of nodes start collapsing, whole network goes down, we lose our ability to create our sense of self. Again, huge impact on performance. When our self goes away, our inner critic, that nagging always on to feed his voice in your head, goes away as well, right? So what, what do we see? Risk taking goes up creativity because you're no longer doubting all your neat ideas goes through the roof. And we experience this as liberation or freedom. We are literally getting out of our own way. Simultaneously, we see a big shift in brain waves. Normally, where we are right now, we are all in beta. It's a fast moving brain wave, right? It's where we are when we're paying attention, we're awake, alert. Flow actually takes place on the borderline between alpha and theta. These are much slower waves. Alpha is daydreaming mode. It's the brain going from idea to idea without a lot of internal resistance. It's often the signature brain wave for creativity, though that research needs more work. Um, theta is where we are in REM sleep. It's the hypnagogic state. So instead of moving from thought to thought without a lot of resistance, there's zero resistance. The green turtle becomes the green sweater, becomes the green planet, right? It's the hypnagogic. Flow is on the borderline. Now, what's interesting about this particular borderline is you also, when you're in theta, you also get another wave called gamma. It's a very fast, sharp, spiking wave. It is the signature of the aha moment. Gamma only shows up in the brain when the brain is combining new ideas together for the first time. It's what's known as binding, right? It's, so it's the signature of the aha moment. Gamma and theta are coupled waves. Um, which means you can only get one with the other. So what this technically means is from a creativity boosting perspective, flow puts you on the edge of aha insight at all times. If you really want to understand how flow helps you do the impossible, you need to know that the state cocktails five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce, right? Flow appears to be the only time we get all five at once. All of these boost physical 
performance, right? They speed up muscle reaction times, increase strength, uh, increase dexterity, lower our threshold, heighten our threshold to pain. More importantly, if you really want to know how they impact our ability to tackle impossible problems, it's their impact on the three sides of the high call, what I call the high performance triangle. This is motivation, learning, and creativity. And I'm going to sort of break them down one at a time for you because I think it's critical. So motivation goes through the roof and flow. Why? Besides being performance enhancing chemicals, the five chemicals that show up in flow are all pleasure drugs. In fact, they're the five most potent pleasure drugs the brain can produce. And flow gives you all five at once. It is a huge high. So when McKinsey finds that top executives are 500% more productive in flow, it's addictive neurochemistry that's underneath that huge spike in creativity. But it's why psychologists talk about flow as the source code of intrinsic motivation. We see something similar with creativity. So we've made a lot of progress recently in kind of the neuroscience of creativity. And one of the things we, we always know at a really simple level, it's always a recombinatory process. So what happens when the brain takes in some novel information, combines it with older ideas to create something startlingly new. Flow and these neurochemicals more specifically surround that process. So when we're in flow, we take in more information per second, so data acquisition goes up. We pay more attention to that incoming information, so salience goes up. We find faster connections between that incoming information and older ideas, so pattern recognition goes up. We find farther flung connections between that incoming information and older ideas, so lateral thinking goes up. And then, since creativity also requires you to take your cool, innovative idea and make it public, right? on the back end of the whole thing, we see risk-taking spike um, in flow. So flow sort of surrounds the creative process, which is why uh, in studies run by my organization, the Flow Genome Project, some stuff done at Harvard and some stuff done at the University of Sydney, we see creativity and flow spike some 400 to 700%. And that sounds like a huge spike. It's crazy. Uh, we just finished a big creativity study. We've got some interesting data, and I'm going to talk about it later. But for now, um, we'll just stop there. But that spike is not out of line with what we see with productivity, and nor is it out of line with what we see with learning. Learning also has a huge impact. These neurochemicals, quick shorthand for how learning and memory work in the brain. More neurochemicals that show up during experience, better chance that experience is going to move from short-term holding to long-term storage. Flows a huge neurochemical spike. Right? As a result, studies run by the DOD and our friends at Advanced Brain Monitoring found that soldiers in flow can learn 430% faster than normal huge number again. And what it suggests is, like we've all heard about the ten, fabled 10,000 hours to mastery, which are not accurate, but that's besides the point. Um, what the research does show is that flow can cut them in half. And all of this is amazing. All of this is kind of the foundation for the revolution in high performance. We're going to come back to this stuff in a minute, but I, for, I want to jump and jump towards the second half. And I want to retell you the same story a few different players from a different perspective. I lied to you earlier when I said it was going to be about the science of spirituality. It's really going to be more technically about the science of mystical experiences. And that science also dates back to roughly the same person, William James. Right? We're going to, so I'm going to retell the same story. William James was not just interested in flow. He was interested in essentially the entire ecstatic spectrum. These are all the experiences at the kind of upper range of, of human experience. Flow states, states of awe, trance states, meditative states, contemplative states, psychedelic states. Um, <clears throat> back then, by the way, flow was treated as a mystical experience. James wrote about it. He pointed out that it has a huge impact on performance, but he thought it was a mystical experience. That's what he thought he was looking at. Um, and William James was looking at all these experiences, sort of the, what's known as the ecstatic spectrum, and he said, wow, you know, whatever you feel about the context, right, they may come out of religious traditions, they may be spiritual, he said, that's fine, but if you can get past that and you look at the data, the data shows you three things. It says that all these states, interestingly, they all make you feel roughly the same, and we'll go come back to that in a second, but they, they're phenomenologically very similar. They all seem to impact performance, and even though they may be based on religions that I, as a scientist, don't believe in, they have psychologically real impacts. People on the other side of these experiences are definitely different. Their lives are more meaningful. They're more fulfilled. And for those reasons alone, you have to take them seriously. Freud came along and said, no, we don't. 
not at all. We're not going to take those ideas seriously. You're out of your mind. Freud, you know, went w agreed with Marx. He thought religion was the opiate of the masses. He wanted nothing to do with it. And more importantly, Freud said, no, no, no. Psychology is about solving pathological problems. We are not interested in psychological poss possibilities. That's not what we do here. Flo got away with it because in the 1950s, Abraham Maslow, who's also back on this list, was studying success. And he found Flo in a, as, as this kind of giant secret to success in everybody he was studying. He was studying Albert Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt and people like that wanting to know how they achieved what they had achieved. And they all found ways to produce Flo and use it to amplify performance. But everybody in his study group was an atheist. So mystical experiences, what James called it, was out. And peak experiences was the more secular term that Maslow used. And that's when the split occurred. But there was another lineage, which was the science of spirituality. And it didn't really do much. But in the 1950s, this guy, this is Wilder Penfield. He is uh, one of the great neurosurgeons of the 20th century. He was an epilepsy ex expert. And back in the 1950s, he was doing all these experiments or all these procedures where he would open up people's brain brain skull, and which you can do, um, not a whole lot of nerves there, so you can do it with local anesthetic and keep people awake. And he was stimulating different portions of people's brains in epileptics, trying to produce not a seizure, but an aura, which is what, it's a, often a violent shift in perception that precedes a seizure. Um, people will see colors or, or smell things. The smell of burnt toast is really common. Anyways, he's going through people's brains, trying to produce these reactions. Once he found a spot, he would scoop it out, and that was sur brain surgery, right, for epilepsy. But when he started stimulating people's right temporal lobe and the, the temporal parietal junction where those lobes come together, weird stuff started to happen. People had out-of-body experiences. People heard visions, they had hallucinations, they had sense presence, which is the feeling of a god or a ghost or a demon in the room with them. And for the first time, somebody went, hey, wait a minute, there's biology underneath our mythology. Whatever else is going on, there's biology there. Now, real science, of course, doesn't study this stuff. And they didn't until this man, Andy Newberg, came along in the late 1990s. And Andy is an incredibly brave man who risked his career to ask a really interesting question. And Andy was really interested in consciousness. He was at the University of Pennsylvania, and he felt that if you were interested in consciousness, you absolutely had to account for the phenomenon known as unity, or cosmic unity, becoming one with everything. And the reason you have to account for it is oneness with everything shows up in every single mystical tradition on Earth. It's in every religion on Earth, and it's there long before there's mass communication. So, if it's everywhere and it's there before there's mass communication, there's probably biology underneath it because it doesn't seem like the whole world is having a mass hallucination, this, right? Doesn't make sense, right? So there's probably some biology there. He wanted to know what is the biology. And he took a look. So he took a bunch of Tibetan Buddhists and a bunch of Franciscan nuns who both experience absolute unity through their meditation practices. For the nuns, it's unia mystica, oneness with Jesus is love. For the, when Buddhists, it's absolute unitary being, oneness with the universe, right? And what he discovered is more hypofrontality, but not quite. What he discovered is this portion of the brain, down here, it's known as the orientation area, gets very, very quiet. It's another efficiency exchange. In the same way that the prefrontal cortex turns off, and this portion of the brain is the right parietal lobe. It's right at the temporal parietal junction, right at the same spot while their Penfield noticed all this activity. And what Newberg discovered is this portion of the brain, by the way, um, he calls it the orientation area because it helps us orientate ourselves in space. What it does is it basically draws a boundary around the body and says, at this point, this is where you end and the rest of the world begins. And you need this boundary so you can walk across a crowded room without bumping into people. Or people who have a stroke or brain damage to this area, they can't sit down on a couch because they're not quite sure where their leg ends and the couch begins. During intense concentration in meditation, when the brain needs extra energy for focus, it takes it away from this area. This area shuts down. No energy in, no energy out. As a result, because you can no longer separate from self, self from other, the brain concludes, it has to conclude, at this particular moment, you're one with anything, everything. So this is where the stories come back together. Indy Newberg did this research in the early 2000s. I was at that point studying surfers who were doing amazing things, and they kept coming to me saying, hey, man, when I'm out there, when I'm surfing a tube, I am one with the ocean. 
and it kept happening, and I was a surfer, and I knew what they were talking about because I had had that experience. And I just wrote, about, wrote it off and never talked about it out loud because what could be flakier than a surfer running around talking about being one with the ocean, right? It's terrible. And yet, it was all over the place, everywhere in surfing. And I went and to Dr. Newberg, and I, and I said, Andy, is it possible we're looking at the same thing? Could the oneness with everything the surfers are looking at be the oneness with everything the Buddhists are looking at, the concentration? And we did some work on it and thought about it a lot. And the answer is yes, of course. The amount of concentration you need to ride a wave is the same amount of concentration you need for prayer and meditation. Um, now it seems so obvious. Back then, it was a big step forward. It was also the first of a bunch of step forwards along similar lines. So over the past 20 years, neurotheology, since Dr. Newberg discovered oneness with everything, we have looked at pretty much every altered state you can possibly imagine and every so-called mystical state you can possibly imagine, prayer states, contemplative states, states of awe, trance states, psychedelic states, et cetera, et cetera. And what we discovered is that William James was totally right. I mean, he was so ahead of his time, it was crazy. From a neurological perspective, from a phenomenological perspective, all these states, and these are some weird states. So what you're saying is a surfer in flow riding a wave is experiencing the same thing as a Zen Buddhist meditating in a monastery is experiencing the same thing as somebody at Burning Man on a psychedelic. That's pretty odd, but that is exactly, it turns out, what we seem to be discovering. Neuro, the neurobiological of this entire ecstatic spectrum, we see the same three things, right? We see the prefrontal cortex deactivate, and then if the state is really intense, we see activation and deactivation at the temporal parietal junction. We see brain waves drop down to the alpha theta borderline, and we see some combination of these big five neurochemicals. Um, we also see a lot of phenomenological overlap. All of these states doesn't matter if we're talking meditative states, states of awe, psychedelic states, flow states. The selfless is consistent in all of them. By the way, uh, to get at this list, um, I should back up. Uh, I wrote uh, Stealing Fire, which is the book that I'm talking about with uh, my partner, Jamie Wheel, in the Flow Genome Project. And one of the bits of research that we did is everybody and their mother, from William James forward, has an altered a way of defining altered states and measuring altered states and thinking about altered states. And the problem with most of them is they're very context dependent. So when Buddhists talk about what they experience in meditation or in trance, you get very Buddhist interpretations. And the same thing with Christians and blah, blah, blah. If you go back to the 60s, and even if you were dealing with like 60s psychologists, there was all kinds of rebirthing stuff coming up. So you have versions of altered state spectrums that have neonatal this and that. And we wanted something that was context independent. We're just interested in how it makes you feel, how it shifts feelings, and that's it. And this is what we've come up with. Um, it has not completely validated. We've run it by tons of researchers. A lot of people find it very, very useful. It has not been validated. There may be something we're missing, but we're certain about this stuff. Selflessness, because the prefrontal cortex turns off. Timelessness, because the prefrontal cortex turns off. Effortlessness is this feeling in mystical experiences, we talk about this as being propelled by gods or ghosts or forces beyond our control, and in flow we talk about this as effortless effort, right? And what it really is, is it's five of the most addictive neurochemicals the brain can produce showing up in your system and making things feel amazing, and you obviously want more of it. And the richness refers to information richness, and it, the idea is quite simple. I, in the same way that creativity is amplified, it's amplified in all these states, because all these states surround the creative process and amplify, and we get lots and lots of data. And we are seeing, this is where the revolutions come together, we're actually seeing both sides of the coin. So Freud said psychology has to be about curing the sick, and that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing, because these states are very, very similar, because they're neurobiologically similar, they're similar in impact. So I want to talk about what we're seeing in PTSD research. So I said earlier that flow can be useful treating anxiety because it resets the nervous system. PTSD is the most extreme anxiety disorder we have. And we suck at treating it, generally. right? SSRI is the only kind of known treatment for PTSD. 25 million Americans, by the way, are suffering PTSD at any one time. So it's an epidemic. Right? And all we've got for them is SSRIs, which A, you have to take for the rest of your life. B, they don't work on everyone. There's a ton of treatment resistant depression and PTSD. They rarely work in women. Um, they're not great drugs. 
So about 10 years ago, Rick Doblin and the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Research said, hey, let's try psychedelic therapy. Now, psychedelic therapy combines a psychedelic and talk therapy, right? Blends it together. And they tried MDMA therapy on soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq with PTSD, victims of child abuse, and victims of sexual abuse. And what they discovered is one to three sessions of, P of MDMA therapy, so using the same psychedelic MDMA that's inside of ecstasy or molly, um, was enough to significantly reduce or completely cure PTSD. And it's been six years since those studies have been run. And we know that it's persistent. It stays gone. Nobody's had to go back from further treatments. So exciting is this to the FDA that they fast-tracked MDMA as a treatment for PTSD. And we're going to see it's already in phase three trials. And we're going to see it as a medicine by 2020. Um, in fact, the FDA was so impressed with MDMA and its ability to treat PTSD that they're now looking at it as a treatment for regular depression and anxiety. Um, so that is moving forward. Not everybody wants to do a psychedelic to deal with their PTSD. OK, said the DOD. At Camp Pendleton, they reran the exact same study. This time, they swapped out the psychedelic. They put in flow. They used surfing and talk therapy, put over 1,000 soldiers through this protocol. And what did they discover? because the neurobiology is very similar, five weeks of surfing and talk therapy was enough to significantly reduce or completely cure PTSD in returning soldiers. Then the DOD said, OK, that's cool. Let's try it again with meditation. They did. Four weeks of mantra-based meditation, 20 minutes a day, was enough to significantly reduce PTSD. And when I say significantly reduce, I mean they're off their meds or significantly off their meds or it's completely gone. So three different approaches, three different altered states right? that you would not normally associate with one another, yet very similar impacts. And we see this on the curing side of the equation. We also see it on the high performance side. right? We, see, we talked earlier about flow's impact on creativity. Well, there's some really cool research that was done in the Netherlands, for example, where they were looking at open senses meditation. Um, this is where you're taking in information, you're not judging it too harshly, but it's not mantra or focus meditation. Open senses meditation tends to be very, very good for divergent thinking. Focus meditation is good for convergent, it turns out. But they're seeing, uh, in the studies they were on, um, three 45-minute open monitoring meditation sessions, enough to significantly increase fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration, which are four key characteristics of uh, creativity. And microdosing, which are sub-perceptual doses of psychedelics, right? So you're taking small, small doses of psychedelics. Microdosing, James Madibin's research has found, on average, you're getting a 200% boost in creativity. And I'm just, the list, so this is a list. The original microdosing creativity study was done here in Silicon Valley. It was done back in the 60s. It was the last legal study done before they shut down LSD research. Literally, they shut it down the next day. But he took a bunch of people from the valley, and he said, OK, all you guys, it was people who were selected because they had spent months trying to solve a hard technical creative challenge. And he gave them, my, and gave them microdose, sub-perceptual doses of hallucinogen. This is a list of some of the stuff that came out the other side that was incredibly useful. Improvement to a magnetic tape recorder, math theorem regarding NOR gates, new model of a photon, space probe to measure solar properties, new building design, on and on. Right. So huge practical boost in creativity. We're seeing the same thing. In fact, you saw earlier on that list technologically mediated states. Really crazy study done at the University of Australia on creativity and flow. They took a bunch of people and they gave them the nine dot problem to solve. You've seen this connect nine dots with four lines in 10 minutes without lifting your pencil from a paper, right? Under normal conditions, less than 5% 5 people, 5 of people can solve it. In their study group, nobody did. Then they used transcranial magnetic stimulation. They in artificially knocked out the prefrontal cortex by sending a weak magnetic pulse. So it's artificially induced transient hypofrontality artificially produces 20 to 40 minute flow state, 50% of their study group solved that problem in record time. So we're seeing on all, all these wildly different states, same impact on both sides of the spectrum. They have potential to really treat intractable conditions, and they have the potential to massively improve performance. This, by the way, just in case you're curious, um, the one thing I haven't talked about, we talked about neural anatomy, neural chemistry, and neural electricity, which are three of the things you need to talk about to talk about brain stuff. We did not talk about networks, 
But just so you have some idea of where that heightened creativity is, uh, when I, you're on psychedelics, this is work done by Robin Carhart Harris. He's at Imperial College doing really great imaging studies on psychedelics. We've teamed up with them to do the very first flow and psychedelic side-by-side -side comparative contrast altered state study um, that we're going to be launching, I think, first week of June. Um, so coming up. But anyways, on the left side, this is your brain, brain connectivity under normal conditions. On the right side, that is what your brain looks like in psilocybin. It is the most network connectivity we, we see in the brain. That is why creativity is going through the roof. This is also why we're now seeing, this is the cover of The Economist, and it still makes my brain explode to look at it, Tur tune on, turn on, and drop by the office. It is about microdosing at work, and it's the cover of The Economist. So yeah, this stuff is really going, starting to go mainstream. And the best news of all is that this consciousness is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly hackable, and you don't actually have to take a psychedelic substance. So on the flow side, we talked a little about psychedelics. I want to jump back to flow. One of the things that we've discovered very, very recently is that flow states have triggers. These are preconditions that lead to more flow. So if you're interested in kind of hacking your consciousness with this stuff, these 20 triggers are your toolkit. And we have individual triggers. There are 10 or 11 of these that will drive an individual into flow. And then we have group triggers. This is the product of Keith Sawyer's research at the University of North Carolina. And there are 10 group triggers. And group triggers will drive a team into flow, produce a collective shared flow state known as group flow. Right? You've taken part in a great brainstorming session where the ideas are flying off the wall. That's group flow in action. If you've seen a fourth quarter comeback in football or basketball, that's group flow in action. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about these triggers in a second, but the one thing I want to tell you, just so you know, is flow follows focus. Only shows up when all our attention is in the right here, right now. That's what these triggers do. They drive our attention into the present moment. More specifically, not all of them, but most of them tend to drive norepinephrine and dopamine, which are our main focusing chemicals. That's really what's going on under the hood. Now, I, wanna, uh, I don't want to leave you hanging. I want to give you some practical advice. So I said we just did a giant study on creativity and flow. Um, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. About 2,100 people took part. And what we were looking at is, among other things, what triggers are most associated with heightened creativity. Um, first, we wanted to look at the big numbers that create creativity with this 400 to 700% spike. We were like, well, what the hell is that? What was actually, what do we mean by creativity? So we broke creativity down. We looked at the process portions of creativity. And so we found that idea generation, for example, goes up 40%. Problem solving goes up 40%. And so you start to see where those big numbers come from because these things start to stack on one another. We also found three triggers are most associated with creativity across the board in knowledge workers. Right? So what everybody in this room does for a living. The first is obvious, complete concentration. Flow follows focus, only shows up when we're in the right here, right now. But what that means, by the way, is the research shows us that you need 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration to really maximize flow. So that means you need 90 to 120 minutes where your office door can be shut, where your phone is off, where your email is off, where Facebook <laughs> is off, where Twitter is off. It means if you're running a team, right, and you're telling your team members that they have to email you back in a half an hour, you're literally locking that team out of the very state of consciousness they need to maximize performance. For example, it's why when I go into organizations, I always tend to say, if you can't hang a door, sign on your door that says, beep off, I'm flowing, you're sunk, right? Next thing we see with creativity is it requires the challenge skills balance, often called the golden rule of flow, most important of flow's triggers. The idea is that we pay the most attention to the right here, right now, task at hand, when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch, but not snap. Emotionally, this means flow sits not on, but near the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation, I could give a shit, and anxiety. Whoa, way too much stimulation, right? In between is this sweet spot. Um, finally, immediate feedback. This is, should come as no surprise here at Google. but. You know, this is one of the reasons, by the way, we saw so much flow in action sports. 
mass in action sports, you have immediate feedback. You're a skier, you don't set that edge at the top of the run, you're on a face first death slide to the bottom. It's really obvious. Same thing happens in software, of course. Agile software, the entire agile movement, right, was about tightening up feedback loops, and one of the reasons is it maximizes creative flow, right? And so obviously, you know, in business, for example, if you've got quarterly reports or annual reports and that's the only feedback you're getting, it's a disaster for this stuff. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about the triggers is um, they're remarkably easy to train. And if you would have come to me five years ago, in fact, the last time I spoke here, I mean, two times ago, um, and said, what, what do you believe about flow? What would you bet your house on? I would have bet my house that this stuff is massively hard to train. Absolutely. Turns out we were deadly wrong about that. Um, the example is uh, two or three years ago, thanks to Adam Leonard, um, we teamed up with you guys and ran a six-week joint learning exercise, right? And over a course of six weeks, we took about 70 Googlers from all over the company, so facilities and sales and marketing and coding and engineering and take your pick, and we trained people up um, about an hour's worth of homework a day in four high-performance basics. I mean, basics like sleep hygiene, right? Get enough sleep at night and then put yourself on a sleep monitor to take care of it. Um, and uh, the use of really what amounted to four flow triggers. And on the back end of that, we trusted flow pre and post. We found a 35 to 80% increase in flow um, here. Now, it's a little high, but because people self-selected to be in that class, right? They were already interested in the topic, so those numbers are probably a little skewed. But I will tell you, we have a digitally delivered course called Flow Fundamentals. And it's the same thing, same similar structure. We were a little more intense with what we did here. But again, we measure pre and post. And on average, and thousands of people have taken this course by now, we're seeing a 70% increase in each of Flow's metrics. And this doesn't mean our kung fu is exceptionally badass, which it is. What it really means is that this stuff is really easy. We're all biologically hardwired for it. Um, which is really, really cool. And we're getting options, right? This is the transcranial magnetic stimulation I talked about. Um, because pattern recognition is so heightened in flow, radar operators, this is a radar operator in the US military, are using it before they go on shift. Stockbrokers, because you can see so much more patterns in Wall Street, are doing this before they're going onto the trading floor. We're seeing similar things in EEG development, right? Back in the 1990s, at the same time Andy Newberg was doing his really brave work, another guy named Richard Davidson started recording the brainwaves of monks, Tibetan Buddhists, who had um, about 30 years of meditation time, and he discovered some really cool things, that their brainwaves essentially sit on the edge of flow at all times, and that there's a huge amount of gamma, which you want for extra creativity in their brainwaves. But who the hell has 30 years? let alone 30 hours, right? So what did we do? Well, we recorded those brainwaves, and now using neural feedback and EEG, we are training to people to move in the same direction in three weeks, three months, very compressed time frames. Um, in fact, if you want more flow in your life, the same technology is available to you. Go to theflowgenomeproject.com. There's a free flow profile there. Um, under the Learn tab. It's a diagnostic, it's a traitology. It says if you're this kind of person, you're likely to find flow in these directions. It's become one of the largest studies uh, in optimal performance ever run. Another, killed another long-standing darling. We thought when we started this work, flow absolutely must show up the most in action adventure sport athletes um, and in sort of performing arts. People in bands, people on stage, that kind of stuff. Turns out, no. The vast majority of our study subjects, I think like 80,000 people have taken the study at this point, are knowledge workers. They do what everybody in this room does for a living. The most flow tends to show up in knowledge work. All right, to wrap this all up, I want to give you one sort of big picture look at all this stuff. So, Stealing Fire origin story. I was writing a book called Rise of Superman about flow, and I was talking to Salim Ismail, who was at that point the executive director of Singularity University, and Salim, uh, former director of innovation at Yahoo, really interested in flow and innovation. And we were talking, and he, he pointed out, he's like, you know, Stephen, if you think about it, every time you go to a sporting event, right, if you go to a basketball game, you're playing to see players in flow. And he said, if you go to see a movie, you're going to see actors in flow, and you're hoping to get a director who was in flow when they shot the movie or a poetry reading on and on. He said, I'll bet it's a large portion of the GDP. And that caught our attention. That caught my attention, and I started thinking about it. And when we started doing the research for stealing fire and figuring out um, that, hey, wait a minute, flow, 
meditative states, contemplative states, psychedelic states, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are very, very similar. We said, well, let's try to measure that. Let's measure the altered state economy. How much money do people spend chasing this experience of selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness, right? And I'm not going to walk you through the calculation. It is in the footnotes to Stealing Fire. Please hammer on it. Run your own calculations. I spent a year working on it. I want like, it to get as rigorous as possible because it's mind-blowing in what it tells us. And the first thing I also want to point out is not all of this stuff is positive, right? When I'm talking about selflessness and effortlessness and information richness and all this stuff, some people seeking it out, they're going and doing meditation retreats or they're developing a yoga practice or they're pursuing flow. And a lot of people are just taking a lot of drugs, right? There's a negative downside, dark side to all of this as well. And we measured that as well. But when we were done, in our very conservative calculation, we came up with a figure that is $4 trillion a year. It is 1 16th of the global economy that we spend trying to get out of our head, trying to shift our consciousness in this way. And as you can see from the stuff I'm talking about, those numbers, because we're getting very precise, we're getting better at this, right? We're being able to tune this in ways like we never could before. We're being able to get some more of the positive benefits and less of the negative benefits. This is only going to grow over time. Um, and I think the last thing I want to tell you today is that I think all this information puts kind of a wonderful and yet really terrible burden on each and every one of us. Because you've got to ask yourself, right, what kind of impossible challenges are you going to go after if you could be 500% more productive, if you could be 600% more creative, if you could cut your learning times in half, right? The science is pretty overwhelming that that's exactly what is available to each and every one of you today, right? As Alice Walker pointed out so many years ago, we are the ones we've been waiting for. But what we choose to do with that information remains entirely up to us. But thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take some questions. So I'm wondering if there's any limits in age for flow. So, and I'm asking, I'm coaching my 10-year-old baseball team, and i uh, like to hear your thoughts on this. It's a great question. Um, so as you were talking, um, I, I don't know if there are upper limits. Um, I really don't, uh, age-related limits. I realized as you were talking, I was like, God, I've never even asked that question or even thought about that. So there may be upper limit stuff that I don't know about. Kids are actually very flow-prone because developmentally, their prefrontal cortex doesn't finish developing until you're 25, right? So um, that's why your nose is the last thing to grow. It's space for your prefrontal cortex, right? Um, and so they're developmentally geared towards transient hypofrontality, and their brain waves are actually naturally closer to alpha than we, we adults are in beta. Kids tend to be closer to alpha. Um, so kids are flow prone, and in, in my book, Rise of Superman, we talked about like the crazy place this is showing up. Flow coaching has gotten into action sports early, right? And we saw it, and skating, for example you routinely see 12 to 14 year old kids win the X Games, beating 25 to 35, like professional athletes. And one of the reasons is because flow coaching has been in action sports for longer, right? In mainstream sports, it popped in. Uh, Jimmy Johnson said the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl back in the 90s, and he credited Chick Sent Me High. So flow's been in sports for a while, but not at the level. It, those Traditional bad and ball sports are a little more conservative, right? Um, and action sports, you know, they weren't even sports back in the 90s, right? Um, so there's been a lot more flow coaching. We're seeing interesting results. Uh, a friend of ours, we are working with um, a, a guy in uh, Minnesota who is doing a bunch of flow work in grade school. And they're using the flow profile with kids uh, and trying to figure out what's their dominant flow area and then having them do a lot of independent studies over the years. And the idea is that they can get them into high school already knowing what produces the most flow in their life and what they're most passionate about, they'll have them a, a leg up. Um, so we're, we're doing some of that work. We're looking at it, but there's a ways to go. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, great talk. Uh, once they, thinking about this, I'm sold. Want to be in flow all the time. Very productive, very great, awesome. But thinking about uh, the chemicals um, that have heightened levels, isn't there supposed to be a crash? Like, yeah, what so, I know? Yeah, I was just, okay, so yeah, <laughs> let me, yeah, yeah, let's stop there. <laughs> so if you were gonna say that, nobody gets to be in flow all the time. Our, like, people come up to me about once a month, and they're like, dude, Steven, Steve, I'm in flow all the time, you should study me. And this has been happening for years. And 
in the beginning, I didn't know what to say. And now I'm, I'm just honest. I'm like, absolutely. We know we have a term for that. We call that schizophrenia. Sometimes we call that mania, depending, but it's an either or, right? Flow is a cycle. This is Herb Benson did a lot of the foundational neuroscience on this, um, and it's a four part cycle. And as you pointed out, those neurochemicals that show up in the flow are expensive for the brain to produce, right? They require minerals, and some of them require sunlight, and some of them require vitamins and foods, and blah, blah, blah. And um, so there's a recovery time, right? Norepinephrine and dopamine, for example. Why are TED Talks 20 minutes long? Because these are your two principal focusing chemicals, and they are mostly exhausted after 20 minutes at peak concentration. So you've ever seen a James Bond movie, right? Everything blows up for the first half an hour, and then you're bored to death for the rest of the time, right? It's because you've exhausted all your focusing feel-good drugs, and now you've just got bad popcorn in your stomach, right? I mean, literally, like, that's that feeling. Um, so yes, on the back side of flow, there is a recovery period, for sure. It's built in. So nobody gets to live in flow, as far as we can tell. Um, even uh, there's some really interesting work. Some people often conflated enlightenment with permanent flow. Like there's an idea out there that enlightenment might be permanent flow. We've actually made some really interesting progress on studying so-called enlightenment. Um, and the one thing that we're pretty sure is it doesn't appear to be permanent flow. It seems that it takes the shift in perspective that you get from flow, that kind of expansive oneness with everything, and it allows you to access it under normal conditions. Um, but it doesn't seem to be a permanent flow state. I don't, I don't think that's possible. Outside of a manic episode, I don't think that's possible. Thanks. Sure. Thanks for asking. Thank you for this fantastic talk. So what you essentially uh, talked about is Meditation 101. A lot of the concepts are very similar. Um, there are these um, um, gadgets these days. Um, they call it the brain balancing. Apparently, they, are so they can induce you into your flow state. Um, there are certain devices, the EEG-based, which uh, people with ADHD use to train, and that is nothing but attention training. So you look at a certain pattern in the screen, and you focus your attention, thereby uh, try to do something rep repeatedly, and you slowly get into your flow state by doing this. So this is well known. But the other kind of devices, this, um, the claim is that you don't need to do anything. You don't need to um, focus your attention, but it plays some signals, uh, some sounds, in your ears, and apparently it's supposed to divert your state towards these flow states. I don't know how much it is true. <coughs> I call bullshit. It's BS. <laughs> okay. um, what I found consistently uh -huh. mm -hmm. is there are a lot of people out there who have a device that measures one thing or does one thing, and they want to call it flow. So we've got this EEG device that drives your brain waves to the alpha theta borderline, and it's going to put you into flow. Well, no, it's going to drive your brain waves to the alpha theta borderline, OK. But flow is changes in network structure. It's changes in neural and anatomical function. It's changes in neurochemistry. It's a bunch of physiological reactions that we're just now starting to maybe measure. And nobody's put it all together in one physiological flow detector at this point, though we are working on one. But anytime I hear a single correlate hypothesis, it takes your brain waves, it does this, it, put, it calling it flow, to me, I don't understand that. Like, I don't, un I don't understand why people are doing that when we know flow has, you know, total shift in brain function. So that's, first of all, when it comes to sound, though I have friends, Will Henschel at Focus Will, um, Brain FM, there are some really interesting groups doing really good work on sound and flow. My friend Chris Berker, who runs Advanced Brain Monitoring in and, and Carlsbad, California, there she's the person who teamed up uh, with the DOD to do the uh, flow and the accelerated learning stuff. Um, let's give a TED talk. You can find that online. One of the things they did is they looked at biurnal beats, right? There were 400 companies doing sound with biurnal beats and supposed to put you in flow and whatever. And they, she literally like put the most, they make just about the best EEG measurement device in the world. Um, I think, and uh, they took every biurnal beats program they could find and looked for any consistent neurological shift, found nothing that was consistent. So I'm not saying that there is this technology out there that I'm, sooner or later somebody's going to crack that, right? There's, we know from Apple's work with Sonos that you know the power of music is really amazing in terms of its ability to shift consciousness. So there's definitely something there, right? But I, we can't, we're not, we're not there yet, I don't think, nothing I've, in a, I've seen. Um, there, probably, there are probably people out there with like breakthrough technology that could tell me I'm lying and don't know, but I haven't seen anything that I 
comfortable with that I think does that yet. I think we're getting closer though, and I, and I think all this stuff is on exponential growth curves. So, you know, what seemed absolutely ridiculous three years ago, you were gonna get in two, two years, three years. Thank you. Sure. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, it's, from your comments, it sounds like you're not a big fan of open office plans. But uh, open office plans are super big fad around here. So my sure. request to you is uh, please rescue us. What can you do for us? Yeah, that's a, it's a fair point, right? Um, uh, and you're not the only one. There was a couple of years ago, right, when Facebook decided they were going to do away with desks entirely and put everybody on walking desks facing each other in a circle. So I don't know if that's true or not, by the way, but I just heard it and I was like, what a disaster for flow. Um, that said, um, open office plans can be really good for group flow, right? Depending, right? They're, they have their purpose, but what I, you know, the companies that I, that I'm seeing that are doing this are building, um, like any of the, uh, the, the co-work spaces that you're seeing pop up, they have little phone booth rooms that anybody can go into and shut the door and it's a private little office. So I'm seeing a lot of companies that like open office plans start to build in silence pods where you can just, you know, close yourself in and lock yourself off. Um, and equally important is you gotta have your conversations about this. Right? If you're not gonna, if you're, if you've got a manager and you don't, they're not into this whole idea of what you're doing, and suddenly you're going off for 90 to 120 minutes and you're coming back being like, I was in flow, it's, you're gonna be fired, right? Like you gotta, so it's gotta be done out loud, I think. People have to understand why this is mandatory. But I think open office plans ultimately, um, I think we're gonna start to see them go away. Um, and I, you know, I think some of this is just that we're going to be 3D printing office buildings and we get complexity for free, so suddenly it's not going to be cost efficient to put everybody in cubicles. We're going to be able to build whole offices and I think the problem is going to get solved. I think it's a money issue less than an open office plan issue at this point. But yeah, they're disasters for flow. Um, so you talked about the psychedelic uh, drugs, but I'm curious, are there studies like uh, seeing how different drugs simulate the flow state, like cocaine, marijuana? So um, the neurochemicals, the big five neurochemicals, um, every time you have uh, a neurochemical, right, you have an exogenous, an exogenous chemical, right? So the body produces endorphins. These are our natural opiates, right? So flow is essentially dopamine, which is cocaine, right? Whenever you use cocaine, all that happens is the brain releases a bunch of dopamine and it blocks its reuptake. Um, you get a little serotonin, that's ecstasy, you know, in one pathway or, or LSD in another, anandamide, which as you said is THC. Um, norepinephrine is essentially speed and uh, I don't know what I'm forgetting here. Um, but the point is, you actually couldn't cocktail those drugs on the street, which is really interesting. Some of them counteract. You're going to end up dead or in a coma if you try, right? What's cool is the brain can cocktail them all naturally, and you don't tend. I mean, now this does mean, you know, flow has a dark side, right? It's a very sticky state. It's very addictive, right? And it's just, a, you know, Chick sent me high, said flow is different than most other addictions. Most other addictions lead backwards. Flow, because it always, you're always extending your skills because you're walking up that challenge skills balance, is an addiction that leads forward. But if you have a high flow lifestyle, um, the Navy SEALs, who we do some work with, when the Navy SEALs stop being Navy SEALs, when an action sport athlete stops being an action sport athlete, right? when a rock star stops being a rock star, these are massively difficult transitions to handle. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing, uh, for example, in soldiers returning from combat and things like that, is these are such high flow environments that compared to regular life, it's really difficult and that's a big portion of the difficulty. And we're doing some work around that to try to see what we can learn there. There's a long way to go, but we're poking at it. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, so two more questions popped up on Dory. Um, the first one is um, about the concept of flow hike. Uh, that we discussed <laughs> okay. on a podcast. Uh, how can we translate flow states uh, that we achieve through athletic pursuits uh, to everyday life? Um, so part of that answer, um, 
Did they want me to break down the flow hike, or was that? Uh, basically, if I understand the question correctly, um, how we can sort of um, uh, use the flow hike. Okay, I'll. Uh, um, well, the, okay, so the, there's a couple of different answers. Um, the first answer is flow is a focusing skill, essentially, right? Like whoever said it was like meditation 101. A lot, there's a lot of fundamentals there, right? We, we train people in mindfulness because flow follows focus, right? So you want to drive that focus into the present tense. Um, how did I get here? What did, what did you ask me? I totally lost my place. I looked at you. I did the meditation thing. What was the question? Flow hike or flow through athletic pursuits? In flow, athletic flow through athletic pursuits. Um, it tends to translate, right? So. The flow training that I get while skiing helped me as a writer, right? It's the same kind of focus, right? So whenever you're training that, you're training that. So there, one one is the athletic pursuits will just naturally bleed over into, into your everyday life. So in other words, the more flow you get, the more flow you get, right? That's across the boards. Um, the flow hike is, uh, is not an athletic pursuit hike. It's actually a daily flow hike. You asked about the neurobiology, right? So this is a hike I use every day. I wake up, I start writing at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I write from 4 to late a.m. And at 8 a.m., I take my dogs for a hike. And it's a hike specifically designed to put me into flow, um, meaning if my writing session was really unpleasant, if I was struggling a bunch, this is going to put me into flow on the back end. And so when I come back to work, I'll, I'll feel refreshed. And um, if it was a flow state, it's a good way to reset my system. But what I do is I start off, and I walk uphill very slowly for 20 to 25 minutes. Low-grade physical activity for about 20 to 25 minutes will produce exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. It's going to deactivate the prefrontal cortex. We all know this, right? You go to the gym, you work out for about 20, 25 minutes, it gets quiet upstairs, right? I then run uphill. I run up cliff faces, or you could just sprint if you want. And I do it for about five minutes or until I'm in pain, basically. And then I sort of slow it down, and I'll, you will get endorphins and anandamide, which are pain relievers. Um, among other things. And then I turn around and I run back downhill, trying to move my feet faster than they would normally move without gravity. Right? So they're big leaps down the mountain. Whenever you take a risk, you get dopamine. And so by the time I'm back down on my path and I'm walking home, I've mimicked all, essentially, a bunch of the neurobiology of flow. It's not 100%. It doesn't work all the time. But pretty much, it'll put you into a low-grade flow state. And I do this between work sessions. And it takes you know, about 45 minutes. And I try to like do my problem solving on the way home, because I'm in a low-grade flow state. And I've got heightened learning and creativity and pattern recognition. And so if there was something that I wasn't doing in my you know, writing, I got stuck somewhere, that's when I try to solve it, because I know I'm going to be in a low-grade flow state. I think that's a great place to end. Thanks, guys.